Don't say the wrong thing. Either way. All right, good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for Tuesday, November 29th, 2016. And we have some new, a new face at the table tonight. We're joined for the first time by our new town administrator, Michael Dennehy. Michael, welcome. Thank you, Katie. Yep, great being here. And Anne-Marie Fagan's staying on for a while, and she's going to be at, the, at least the next couple of meetings with us. Um, yes. and, uh, and of course, Emily Martin and, and the board. So we're, we're pleased to have Michael on board. and. Uh, I'm sure everyone in town will be getting a chance to meet you over the next few months as we try to get to different civic organizations and different boards and groups in town. So welcome aboard. Thank you. The first item on our agenda tonight is um, we have no minutes to approve, so we're going to go to future meeting dates. We're scheduled to meet next Tuesday, December 6th, at the Senior Center, and that's going to be a meeting which the primary focus of that meeting will be a public meeting on an application for a letter of support for a medical marijuana dispensary that we mentioned at the last meeting. That public hearing will start at 7.10, but the meeting itself will begin at 7. Our next dates, we, uh, does December 20th work for everyone? I believe it does, yeah. Yeah, I believe I saw that and I believe it does as well. Okay. The other option Ms. Martin had identified was the 13th, if the 20th doesn't work. Yeah, that works for me. I'll just check real quickly, but I think it does. Yep. Okay. So we'll confirm this December 6th and December 20th. And then January dates, we have January 3rd, 17th, and 31st. And we we'll confirm those as we get a, a little further along. Citizen speak. Do we have anyone tonight who would like to address the board at Citizen Speak? I don't see any hands. So we will go on to our first item, which is a discussion with our Council on Aging Director, Marianne Sullivan. Hi, Marianne. Good evening, Marianne. Thank you to Emily for putting me on first. <laughs> um, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to offer thank you to Emory Fagan. Um, we've worked together for many, many years. I think she's always been a strong advocate for the seniors of the town of Milton. Um, I know we'll miss her, and I'd just like to, on behalf of myself, the COA board, and the seniors, thank her for all of her support and wish her well. Okay, this is going to be brief. Don't, you know, don't think the cards are. So my last report was in March, and there's been a lot going on at the Council on Aging. We moved forward implementing the survey results, and I'm happy to say that we have had many, many lectures. Uh, most popular, I have to say, was Anthony Simaco. 125 people listened to the story of Howard Johnson, which, if you haven't read it, it's fascinating. Um, some of the speakers are very expensive, but we can usually get them down, so we're, we're thrilled, and we get younger seniors, older seniors, and it's just a wonderful venue. We started painting classes thanks to another great volunteer in the town, Leona Hoy. She comes and teaches painting. Um, we've increased thanks to our instructors. Our health and wellness programs are up 22% in the last six months. The boomers want to come in. They want to do yoga, Reiki, strength training, Zumba Gold, you name it, they do it. Day trips, they asked us to stop them again. We'd, we've only done one so far. It was down to Thimble Island. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it off the coast of Connecticut. We had 102 people go. And it, the interesting thing is now I say hello to people I was in um, PTO or the Junior Women's Club with who are now getting on the vans, <laughs> on the buses to go on the trip, so it's great. We've had classes. They wanted smartphone classes, how to buy off the internet. So a lot of new things going on. The only thing we're still looking for, and I just want to give a shout out here, is anybody who might be a retired Spanish teacher, that was one of um, the identifying requests. So if there's anybody out there, we'd be happy to um, talk with them. I'd like to report that the full-time van driver position could not be better used. We are fulfilling so many more requests, emergencies. Um, luckily, you know, we can pick up the phone and call, and if somebody needs to get up to the hospital, it is working tremendously well, and the seniors are very, very grateful for it. Just a quick story. Um, Michael, you might, might not know this, but I've been in this position for 25 years, and it took a long time to get a full-time van driver, 
and we had it two years ago, and I used to go before the personnel board going way back and say, we need it, we need it. Um, one of the members who since retired of the personnel board had a serious illness, and he called the Council on Aging, and he said, all right, Marianne, tell me about how this works. And I s explained it to him, and we took him into Boston for his treatments, and he said, I never got it when you came before and asked for the position. I get it now, and that the town of Milton should be very grateful we have the service. So I thought That's that great. was great. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank, we have SHINE counselors at the Council on Aging. SHINE stands for Serving Health Insurance Needs of the Elderly. It's funded by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we are so fortunate to have Jane McClellan and Lucy Meadows who volunteer their time. They meet with seniors. They tell them this is called open enrollment in case you want to change your health insurance plans. And since October 1st, they've helped 128 residents save money and get a great plan. They really, really do a fantastic job. I'd also like to thank District Attorney Mike Morrissey for doing a free shred day for um, the entire community. We had 450 residents participate. It was like directing traffic. The traffic was so bad out there, I literally called the police and said, I need help. I was afraid somebody was going to, but it was a wonderful event. And then we recently had a Veterans Appreciation Day luncheon. And thank you so much to all the wonderful people in town who supported it. For the first time, we've been doing this for 15 years, we literally took a paid ad out in the Milton Times to thank the people who have been so supportive. It's just one of the best events we do. Okay, um, challenges as we start the new year, once again, is to balance the needs of the baby boomers and the elders. Boomers are looking for early evening programs and classes, even on sad days. Um, overnight trips now. So we have two planned, one to New York City and one to Bar Harbor. Um, it's what they're asking for, so we're lucky to be working with the company in High Park who seems you know, to be doing a really good job. I'd also like to let you know that many seniors took advantage of the early voting and were very, very grateful that they had it. But then on election day itself, we have the ones who say, nope, that's election day, that's when I'm going to vote. So the VN was nonstop. Um, I'm very pleased that the master plan is looking closely at elder services. Um, towns that we compare ourselves with, Hingham and Duxbury, have already started additions to their senior centers to address the influx of baby boomers. The veteran agent, Kevin Cook, has been a fantastic addition to our team over at the senior center. He's a delight to work with. He's so accommodating to the residents who walk in, and we couldn't be happy to have him with us. We continue to work closely with the police, fire, board of health, and try and be proactive on difficult situations involving seniors. Outreach does a fabulous job of reaching isolated elders and trying to help them establish a plan for their needs. Um, our outreach, I want to say the right term, worker recently was dealing with a senior, had lived in Milton her entire life. She's 92 years old, was born in the house she lived in, came to the senior center, was driving. Um, she's 96 years old, her health deteriorated. She had no family at all in the area. And our current outreach worker, Nancy Stewart, spent six months working with her, stopping on her way home to see how she was doing and to try and, it's very difficult when seniors are in a bad situation, they have the option of, you know, not accepting help. You know, it's their choice, and sometimes it's a bad choice. And Nancy worked with her for six months and finally got her the services she needed desperately to stay in her own home and to be safe. So I think outreach does a wonderful um, job for the town. Going That's wonderful. Please give our thanks and I appreciation will. to Nancy for that. That's really And good. again, going forward with our 2018 budget, last year I came before you and asked the position of outreach coordinator to be established. It was approved by the personnel board, the warrant committee, and the board of selectmen. So, you know, here we go again looking at you know, <coughs> the, funding would, was the funding was an issue. The funding is, you know, roughly $38,000 in a budget like this. It's just such, I can't even tell you what an important position it is. And I think in the long run, it really saves the town money because if we can get into a situation and be proactive before, you know, hoarding or isolation, which leads to mental health issues, sets in, I think it's a win situation for the, you know, police, fire, board of health, and the town in general. So, um, you know, we, we do a lot of fundraising, as you know, with the Council on Aging. We don't come before the town to ask for VNs. We, we fundraise, we, we get our VNs. We just, put brand new shades um, in the senior center for $4,000. The friends do a great job. But I just think that this position, I mean, $38,000, I, I just hope we can find the money somewhere to get it 
into the budget and um, funded as we go forward because the needs are not going away they're just getting greater we enjoy working with all the town departments um, we work as a team at the Council on Aging you know we're open to whatever anybody needs will help um, very responsive to residents we might not be able to fix every single problem but I can assure you that we take the time to return a phone call to talk with a senior who might just walk in off the street and say I need some help so um, we look forward to having you over Michael to visit the senior center yeah. it's not Can't scary wait. you know yeah. once you step inside there you're gonna like it and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have any questions or comments for Marianne and the only question Marianne um, the um, <clears throat> Uh, the overnight trips and, and all the, the new things, uh, are they all self-funding? Yes. They are. Yeah. Good. So we're working with a company in High Park, um, they're called BRS Transportation, so the seniors, um, like Thimble Island is $85 and that covers everything. There's no money made on it. Yeah, you know, it's just, it just covers the no cost. Money no, yeah. no money drains. I don't have to go on the trips. I would like to sometimes, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen. But it's just, it, it just fills a need for people who are recently retired, who don't want to drive, and who say, here's what I want to do, and if we can do it, we'll do it. A lot of senior centers do like cruises to Bermuda or uh, trips to Europe. We're not looking at that, but um, it just a few things would give them a chance to you know, sit back and enjoy retirement. Amory, you might want to come on one of those trips with us. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Yeah, um, thank you for a, a very good update, Marianne. Um, one of the things that um, you know I'd like to see, you know, as we move forward with quarterly updates, and I think it would be beneficial for Michael and the rest of the board as well, is to get maybe some written report ahead of time mm -hmm. for us to analyze. I think yeah. some of the questions that I have related to that um, are related around measurable outcomes, how many participants, not just mm -hmm. same old participants, but new participants. Yep, I, think I can that, do that. That's very important for us to look at and to analyze. I think it help, it's helpful data for us, and I think also for uh, the town administration. We don't have it computerized, unfortunately. What we do is we have a checkoff sheet, so when they come in, and then what happens is every month we tally the new people, the number of participants, so I'm happy to share that. But I think seeing the programs and getting mm -hmm. a, um, a list like some of the other department heads do, I think that would be helpful to us just to better analyze and get a better grasp to be able to support you mm -hmm. moving forward on some of your okay. requests. Sure. Um, and then the last one is just event notification. Um, you had a lunch for the veterans. Um, this board and our town administrator were not aware of that. We would have loved to have attended that. Oh, uh, I thought you all get event. the newsletter. And yeah, uh, but I, I, we may get the newsletter, oh, okay. but I don't think that, you know, I think that a yeah. formal invitation would be good because those are our veterans. Those are the people that we mm -hmm. want to be there to support. And, you know, we all have busy schedules for work. It's something that we all probably would have liked to attend. Okay. But, I mean, it's just moving forward. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Okay, Marianne. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Okay, the next item is a conference with our Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition members. Good evening, Laurie and Caroline. Do we have a PowerPoint for this? Yes. So we're joined by Laurie Stillman and Caroline Kinsella. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for inviting us to update you on the progress of the Milton Substance Abuse Prevention Coalition. Our coalition has gained so much interest, attention, and support since we launched this effort through the Milton Health Department a little more than two years ago. In that time, we've accomplished so much. In fact, we were recently recognized for our efforts by the South Shore Hospital's Youth Health Connection when we bestowed their Community Hero Award at a conference with over 300 attendees in September. And a big thank you goes to Ms. Anne Marie Fagan, for nominating us for the award. Here's our award. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. So tonight we're happy to share with you what we've been doing, what we've learned, and where we hope to go in the future. With me is my colleague, Laurie Stillman. Not only is she a resident of the town of Milton, but she's an independent public health consultant. She has helped our health department immensely, along with Deborah Milbauer, in building the bones of the coalition so that we are as inclusive and effective as possible in our mission to prevent and reduce the misuse of drugs and alcohol, especially among youth. Just to give you some context, this month the Surgeon General of the United States, Dr. Vivek Murthy, declared that addiction is one of the defining public health crises of our lifetime. This devastating disease afflicts one in 11 Americans and their families 
costing society $442 billion in 2010 due to crime, health care, disability, and lost productivity costs. But that's not the only cost. Drug and alcohol abuse cost 130,000 lives in 2014. In fact, injuries are the number one cause of death of our youth. And drinking alcohol has been implicated in the majority of these cases. Substance addiction is nothing new. Alcohol addiction has secretly affected families of all backgrounds and in all communities. Drug addiction, on the other hand, has tended to be concentrated particularly in the low-income, high-stress communities. Much of the recent attention to addiction is a staggering increase of drug overdoses across the country, but especially in Massachusetts. As a result of addiction to prescription pain relievers, also known as opioids, doctors and dentists previously unaware of how dangerous they can be have been freely prescribing them to adults and children, especially over the last 10 years. Adolescents, when they get their wisdom teeth removed or injuries in sports accidents, for example, have, have made them particularly vulnerable. Then by the time they reach adulthood, they become addicted. Over time, their needs increase, and because heroin is much easier and cheaper, opioid than prescription medications, young adults get hooked on heroin and die from overdoses. In this slide, um, it shows, oh, yep, that's it there, that in 2000, there were about 355 deaths, which was uh, in Massachusetts or about one a day. But by 2015, there are about 1,659 deaths that year, over four a day. That's a big increase. And you'll see at the bottom in Milton, for the past uh, six months of 2016, so there's been five deaths in Milton. Now I'm going to um, turn this presentation over to Laurie Stillman. She's going to describe some of our local <coughs> data and how, to, how we hope to focus on our future work um, based on our year-long community assessment. All of our local data can be found on our website, www.milton-coalition.org. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And, um, you know, as Caroline said, this, is, this opioid epidemic has really shined a light on addiction in general. And the fact that um, all demographics are now affected by this um, pain reliever crisis um, even Milton residents are not immune from this. In fact, uh, this past year, we spent, uh, our coalition spent a year collecting data about, local data about Milton. Um, we have two reports on the topic. We've been trying to present uh, our incredibly comprehensive amount of data across the town to sort of raise awareness that this is an issue for us that we need to pay attention to. So for instance, and I'm not going to go through um, all that we have, I'm just going to do highlight one or two slides here, but uh, for instance, between 2013 and 2014, there were 150 cases of um, overdoses for non-fatal overdoses for opioids in Milton. And just in June of 2016, the most recent month where we were able to collect data, there were 22 non-fatal overdoses here in Milton. This is another important piece of information. We were able to collect data from the state of people in Milton who were sent to rehab facilities or who, who had, were self-admitted to rehab facilities. Um, there were 180 admissions to public rehab facilities of Milton residents um, in the year 2014. Let me say that this is the very tip of the iceberg. I don't know whether um, you guys saw uh, a recent an article about um, Milton being one of the top small communities to live in, and they looked at it, a number of characteristics. One of them is, is that Milton is, I think, the sixth highest um, coverage rates of health insurance uh, in the country of other cities our size. Well, the distinguishing piece of information about that is people who are have private insurance don't tend to go to public facilities in the state because of the high amount of stigma associated with alcoholism and d drug addiction. They leave the state and go to a private facility because their health insurance will cover that. Um, as a result, the 180 admissions is just a tip of the iceberg of the number of people that have, um, are going to rehab facilities from Milton. But the other, but the piece of information that it does elucidate is we looked at the trends in of admissions 
in public facilities of Milton residents. And the interesting trend is that historically, most of the people who have um, landed in rehab have done so because of an alcohol addiction. But in the last few years, heroin has become by far addiction, the number one reason why Milton residents are going to rehab facilities. And if you look at that chart between heroin and other opiates, um, about 56% of people who go to the rehab facilities are going because of heroin. And they're mostly young adults. And those young adults don't just start as young adults. They start as kids. And they graduate to um, these addictive substances. And if you don't think that marijuana can be addictive, look at the fact that we have higher rates of uh, marijuana addiction um, than the state, and all of those are kids under the age of 18. Okay. Um, we, one of the major things that we did um, as part of our community assessment is we sponsored a parent survey, an online parent survey. We could not believe the amount of interest and participation. We had over 800 parents participate in that survey, so it was very robust. We learned a lot about the behaviors, the attitudes, the beliefs of parents and their concerns for their children. And um, we did share that in our community assessment. But one of the questions we asked is, do you know of anyone in your immediate family that is in recovery currently? And we were shocked to learn that one in five Milton parents surveyed has an immediate family member in recovery. And that doesn't even um, include all the people who are in active um, substance addiction mode. So why is this important? Well, one in, if there are one in five families who have somebody in recovery, it means that each and every one of us, first of all, knows somebody who is struggling a family that's struggling with addiction. But the other important piece to understand is that in families where there is a, a family tree of someone with an addiction, the chances of a child having that addiction is much higher. So this points to us really having to pay attention to our children because they um, really are at risk of, of addiction as they grow older. So substance abuse coalitions um, are popping up all over the country. And some of them have been around for decades. And some of them are new, like ours. Ours has been around for only two years. Um, so far, we cannot imagine um, how much interest there is. It shouldn't be a surprise in our coalition. We now have 300 members in our coalition. Um, and. Uh, we have probably at least 50 people attending all of our meetings. Uh, I don't know of, since I've lived here for um, a quarter of a century, I don't know of any other grassroots um, effort like this one in Milton. Um, I've been on the school committee, I've been very active in town, and yet so many of the people who come to our meetings I have never met before, they've never been involved in town. Um, politics or activities before, but they are here. This is a picture of um, many of our coalition members attending a day-long conference where we got this award. There were over 300 people there, but you'll see there are students from Milton High School, there are school teachers, there are clergy, there are senior citizens, there are public health effort um, experts. Every, there are so many different kinds of people that are involved in our coalition. And um, our website is just chock full of information and help for people. Um, many of the coalitions that exist and are successful uh, are that way because they have a backbone. They have a, a structure of paid staff and money to devote to activities that will help to sort of reverse the issues. Um, the most common way that many of the coalitions are funded are through federal and state uh, grants. The um, uh, Drug-Free Communities grants, the Mass Department of Public Health uh, gives out grants, and there are also private grants. Um, and there are also earmarks in actually municipal government budgets 
as well as earmarks in state budgets for towns like ours. Um, we were lucky to apply for a three-year grant, a private grant from the Blue Hills Community Health Alliance, and we received that grant, and that's what allow has allowed us to be so incredibly successful in Milton. However, that grant is going to be over next year, and we're in um, fundraising sustainability planning mode so that we don't lose all of the momentum and successes that we've built up so far. Um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the federal government that funds all of these programs, has a prevention framework um, that starts out with every community doing a community assessment, that they build the capacity of their community, all the different sectors to work together on a common, common goals. They recommend going through a planning process as well as then implementing those um, priorities that they've identified in the planning process and then evaluating they, their work and starting that process all over again. We in Milton are going to be doing a strategic planning process even though I think a lot of people are just anxious to move from that capacity building assessment process and go right into um, action mode. But we really need to take the time to plan. And I love this because um, what it says is uh, enough with all the strategic planning, just get out there and kill something. Um, you know, people are anxious to, to do this work. We are going to be having a community strategic planning on December 13th at Curry College. Now again, just as a, a show of interest, I would have been happy if 30 people signed up. To, we just sent out one notice to our membership. We have 75 people signed up to attend the strategic planning um, event. I'm really excited about it and I, I think that we'll be getting a lot out of it. I just want to um, summarize in one page what we found from our community assessment. The biggest problems have to do with our youth. Um, underage and binge drinking are big problems in the Milton community. Um, there was a survey that was conducted by the Milton Public Schools called the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey. It's a CDC-designed survey. Communities all over the nation, it's a validated survey, have used it. It uncovered that um, at least 50% of our kids are regularly drinking. That's 40% higher than the state average. But more concerning is that 35% of our kids report regularly binge drinking. That means that they're drinking at least five servings of alcohol at one time. It's the largest cause of death of children. And our rates are 100% or double the rate of Massachusetts. This is an issue that needs to be dealt with. Regarding marijuana consumption, about a third of our kids are regularly using marijuana. That's a third higher than the state. The good news is that other drugs are used at a lesser rate than the state. That's good news. But the trend for using, misusing prescription drugs is going up. And that's why we've identified that as a problem, because we see what's happening to young adults. So those are our three problems. And the biggest contributors, based on numerous focus groups that we did and key informant interviews, as well as surveys of youth and parents, showed that our town has a strong tradition of youth and adult social drinking. There's easy access to alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drugs at home and in the community. There's a lack of clear expectations or monitoring of alcohol and drugs in the home and in the community. There's a lack of information and student or coping or parenting skills that people want to have more of. There's strong peer pressure to drink and to do certain drugs. There's a lack of youth social activities. That was a big complaint that our kids said, is that we're just plain old bored after school on the weekends. There's nothing for, our, for us to do in the community. And this is gathering in the woods to drink is what our form of um, social activity. Um, there's a shortage of emotional resources like youth counseling at the schools or in the community, and our kids report high rates of stress and depression. And finally, stigma and the fear of getting help is a big issue that needs to be addressed. 
So just to wrap up, we're going to be having this, um, we're going to be developing a strategic plan that's going to focus on prevention. And our focus on prevention is going to be on youth to delay, reduce, and avoid consumption because we know that nine out of ten people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol started when they were young. And if we can delay use as long as possible, we can um, get at the addiction problem. Um, finally, we want to say that our accomplishments include we have formalized operating procedures and a governance structure. We have a steering committee comprised of Steve Keel, Caroline Kinsella. Um, we have a professor from Tufts University, Dr. Susan Koch Wesser. Um, we have the head of physical health and education from the um, schools, Mr. Noel um, Vigue. And um, Vicki McCarthy are, are part of our. Um, steering committee, but we also have 16 people, part of a core stakeholder group, representing 10 different sectors of our community, from the media to business to the schools, the police. It's really fantastic. We have, we, at our last look on our website, we've had 500 Milt, individual Milton users use our website just over the past year. We, com, we um, did this community assessment. We've hosted numerous educational programs and drug pay, take back days, and we're about to engage in a strategic planning session. So I guess the last point we want to make is, is that we are really nervous about losing our grant next year. And so what the, one of the main reasons we are here is to let you know that we are gearing up to apply for a federal grant, the Drug Free Communities Grant. This is a 10-year, $1 million grant. Um, there are many, many communities in Massachusetts who get that grant. Usually they're in um, existence for longer than we are, but because we have accomplished so much and we have all of the bones that are needed to apply, we've been encouraged by numerous people, including the DA, that we're ready to apply for this grant. This is a very big endeavor. We, ha we don't have a grants.gov account. We um, have to develop a SAM account. There's just so much that will need to be done, um, including raising $100,000 worth of in-kind um, donations to match the $100,000 per $125,000 per year grant. But we wanted to bring this to your attention and to make sure that you're okay with um, us doing this. Many, many towns go through their health department, through their town government. Arlington, I have a whole list of Needham, people. Natick. Needham, Natick, Natick, Wakefield, Reading, Arlington. I mean, just many, many towns are, are doing this. It would be unfortunate if we did not position ourselves to do it. But through this transition of a town administrator, we want to make sure that everybody is on board because this is going to be a Herculean effort to do this. But if we do, it will be just fantastic. So what kind of support would you need from town government? For that? You, because you're a, you're a nonprofit. You're a 501c3 nonprofit. No. No, you're not. No. No, we would need to apply through the town of Milton, just like all the other programs pretty much okay. do, is they apply through the town government. It's um, technically managed by the health department, but we are not a 501c3. Okay. We will be applying for one, but it takes time to get, and we wouldn't have been in existence for long enough or had the credibility. They like to see town governments apply for this because they have the accounting structures um, and the office space and all the other things that would be needed to make this happen. So that's why we want to make sure that you are okay with it because <coughs> this is going to take well over 100 hours to write and uh, we don't want to find out at the last minute that there was not support. Sounds like it's probably something that the selectmen and the Board of Health working together could tr probably support with resources, and since Caroline's our health director, with resources maybe in the health department as well as in the selectmen's office. Um, it's certainly a, a very worthwhile Definitely is. goal to yeah. support in any way that we can. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear it's, it, it, it's a crisis mode, and um, it's not going to get any better unless we, you know, all put our heads together and, and try and do something about it. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, a, a joint, you know, 
collaboration between the Board of Health and the, and the Board of Selectmen um, with all the great work that you guys have done with the steering committee and also with the great leadership and with Chief King and what he's done uh, at the forefront of this. I think that, you know, we've really got the ball rolling and I think that, you know, if we can come together, get a little bit more information um, from you, Caroline, on how to make this happen, I think it makes us sensible. This is a competitive uh, grant, though? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, yeah, so we're it, talking it's, a million it's dollars. Yeah, this but is, it's a rank. I know Laurie's got a lot of experience in grant writing. So I have a lot of have successful Laurie's experience. experience writing federal grants, so I'm going to take the lead in doing it. Mm -hmm. And we've already met with Ms. Fagan and um, uh, our town treasurer and our town accountant to start putting in place all the different things that we're going to need to get the ball rolling. I can write the narratives. I can. Um, work with the accountant to pull together the budgets. I can get the support letters. I can identify where we might get the in-kind support, but we're going to need the help of town employees to do things like get us a DUNS number, um, to help us uh, on the computers to set up the grants.gov account, those kinds of things, um, and maybe even a letter of support. When would this grant have to be applied for? How much time do we have? Um, the RFP usually goes out every year, somewhere between December and January, and then it's due in mid-March. But it takes literally six weeks to three months <coughs> just to get all the different systems approved. I mean, first you have to get a DUNS <coughs> number, then you have to apply for a SAM account, then you have to go to grants.gov grants and they have to get that approved, then you have to go to the online application system and one has to follow the other. That's why we want to get this started now <coughs> so that all of those systems are <coughs> so that when the RFP gets released, we can just start writing. <laughs> well, as Tom said, it's a crisis situation, so clearly there's a need for priority treatment here and for support from the town, so I, I think we'd probably want to make this a priority for the board if everyone agrees and, and, and I guess you know direct that town administrator and the staff to do what we can to set up some meetings with, with Lori and Caroline and Deborah and, and others to start working in, in this direction. I know Anne Marie's already started the process um, with meetings, so uh, perhaps we should have a follow-up discussion at some point. Maybe whenever it might make sense for you to come back in as you start this grant process and give us an update as to as to where you're at in working with, with Mr. Dennehy and sure. Mrs. Fagan and, and the others. That would be great. Yeah. Ms. Fagan has been very supportive of us throughout this process. You all have been. Um, uh, Superintendent Mary Gormley and Chief King have been enormously supportive. We couldn't have a better town <laughs> to work on this process. And I will admit that when we first started and I was going to be presenting all of this data, I expected a lot of pushback and people saying, you know, don't make the town look bad. But instead, people are just really proud about working on something to better their community. And people are stepping up to the plate. It's a beautiful thing, really. It's good. It's really a shame that we, um, we can't do more with youth activities in the town. But I mean, budgets are so tight. Um, people's time, volunteer time is so tight that, I mean, we, 40 years ago, we probably had more youth activities than we have today. I'm, I'm willing to bet, um, you know, which, which is unfortunate. It is, but you know, if the town through a strategic planning process identifies that developing a youth center or some activity, I know that there are a lot of churches who said they want to step up and maybe help, yeah, that we might be able might to yeah. be able to get small grants and volunteers to make something happen because many towns do have that. That's one, the one area I think that Milton is really deficient quite frankly. Yeah. And, it, and it's part, it, leading to the problem of all these kids, quite frankly, in the woods, drinking every weekend. Um, and parents are really upset about it. Sure. Laurie, you're going to build my argument for consolidation. I've been, I've been trying to trumpet this one through for a while, so I appreciate that. And, <laughs> and I think that at the end of the day, we'll get there. Um, I really do believe that, that um, we do, like Tom said, need more youth activity. We do need a youth center. I think that um, programming now is zero to 99. It's not just um, specific age groups. It's about keeping everybody active and keeping everybody together. So I think that, you know, unfortunately, something so bad as this is going to prove that. Um, what it's going to do is get more people across the town to work together for a common goal to take this over and then work on some positive things. Absolutely. 
Well, I well, feel really great that there's so much positive energy around this table. We're going to donate the time and, and try and make this ha grant happen. It may take a couple of tries, but let's start now. I sure. feel pretty confident that we're going to get this down the road. So let's keep our fingers crossed. It's definitely crossed. worth applying yeah. for <laughs> and, and uh, seeing if we can get. So uh, I hear from our board a consensus that this is a priority Absolutely. for us. Absolutely. And, and yeah. um, we'll work, do whatever we can to help make this happen. And if, it, if we need some joint meetings with the Board of Health or any of the other boards, we're happy to, always happy to do that as well. Awesome. And so I'll get brought up. So much, Carolyn. I'll get brought up to speed quickly from Ms. Fagan, and I'd love to sit down with you uh, this week and, and read through it. Thanks for your support. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank very, you. Very Thanks. interesting information. Night. Don't forget your award there. You want to want to leave that? <laughs> Good one. Thank you both for coming in. All right. <laughs> Number seven on our agenda tonight is um, a follow-up to a discussion we had at our last meeting. We have. Uh, Firefighter Kevin Kelly, who's here, and also our Human Resources Director, Paige Polito. This is a discussion about um, compensation for those employees who are actively involved serving in the military. Good evening to both evening. of you. Thank you. All right, so the, the board has a memo from the from the, the Human Resources Director, but we also uh, have some information now from Mr. Kelly. Why don't we start with Mr. Kelly and uh, to follow up on what you presented to us the last time, and then we can give uh, Ms. Ippolito a chance to talk. Sure. Um, thanks for your attention to this matter. I promise not to read but, uh, the whole thing, but I'll forget it if I don't. Um, <clears throat> so Chapter 13 is the... Town Personnel Bylaws. It was adopted in 1956 in Article 8 of the Town Meeting. <clears throat> um, under that, military time is covered under fringe benefits. Uh, it's stated that the town will follow applicable state and federal laws when it comes to the fringe benefits, the fringe benefit of military time. The federal law that covers military time is a town called USERA, I mean, a law, sorry, called USERA, the Uniform Service Employment and Reemployment. The purpose of this is to protect service members from discrimination. <clears throat> it covers both private and public sector jobs. Uh, the types of discrimination that, that occur with ser service members are not hiring an employee because they're in the guard or reserve and could cost the town or business money. Um, holding a reservist back from a promotion due to the possibility of missed time fulfilling their patriotic obligations. Having more than one employee um, serving in the reserves and treating them differently for any reason, favorable or unfavorable. Um, <clears throat> USERA's most reported violations are due to employers not really knowing the law um, rather than you know, singling somebody out. The common, commonly reported violations of this federal law are uh, employees cannot be forced to use vacation or sick time to go to drill. Employees are required eight hours of continuous rest before reporting to drill, and eight hours of continuous rest from the time they get out of drill until the time they start the next shift. Employees are not required to swap shifts to go to drill, just to notify their employer and their employer's responsibility to cover their shift. Um, it covers other topics and should be read and followed by our town personnel board. <clears throat> the law that we're talking about is Mass General Law, Chapter 33, Section 59. Um, I gave you guys all a copy of it, but <clears throat> in a nutshell, the law, the law covers up to 34 days for missed time for, for drill and um, for the two weeks in the summer. And it covers the first, the town would be responsible for the first 30 days of a, of a deployment, paying their full salary. The remainder of the deployment, they would have to, just like under USERA, uh, make up the difference between their, sa their salary and their military base pay. Um, it will come at some cost to the town. However, the salaries of these men and women are already budgeted for items. You know, it's not, their salaries are already in the budget and the money that is being deducted from their salaries is, it, is roughly 3500 to $5,000 a year per member. Um, so that would be the cost to the town. Um, <clears throat> if we look at that number, $5,000, the high end of that number, which it's usually not quite that much, is 0.1% uh, of the total fire department budget. It's 0.006% of the town's annual budget. 
in this sense it's not really a lot of money however if you look at it another way it's eight to nine percent of the base salary of a firefighter of his take-home pay for his family um, speaking with Amory and Paige over some time about this they told me the town had some fears about adopting this law um, one of them is that if we adopt this law all the uh, police and fire we're gonna go and re-enlist and join the National Guard um, 20 of the 55 firefighters are veterans 36 percent of that number um, uh, I'm sorry 36 percent of our fire department of that only one firefighter stayed in the guard after being hired by the town of Milton um, we have not had a reservist since 1992 that was firefighter Jake Jordan he served honorably from 1978 to 1992 after speaking with him he was paid for his weekend drills at that time um, did speak with um, the police chief Richard Wells regarding this matter and he told me that he did pay his police and his cadets for their drill weekends so they were treated in a different manner than than our guys are being treated you know um, let's see what else do I have on this oh uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say that I don't think that the town's current policy um, is a reflection of the respect that you know the town people have for the for our service members and I just like to see it get updated you know the last time it was updated was the last time our union contract was updated was 1978 for Jake Sheridan um, but I don't think the town's um, personnel policy on this has been updated since the 50s it's that's pretty much all I have so okay thank you mr. Kelly so let's give Missy Belito a chance to address um, yes, this issue she and we have a, your memo the town's um, current policy is 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 not current, but it does um, allow um, for making up the difference between your salary and your military pay. For example, for firefighter Allen, just for instance, if he made a thousand dollars a week um, for being a firefighter and was paid eight hundred dollars from the military, we would pay him two hundred dollars. He was always made whole and received full benefits, um, lost no time as far as vacation, all of his accruals that kept accruing. And um, it falls into the law of uh, USERA with paying the difference. And are you speaking for all of his drills or just for his two weeks in the summer? Because his, no, his, I'm speaking week, his of monthly drills, he's not made a whole lot. His monthly drills right now he should be that's what our policy states that he should be made right, paid not, up the difference that's not what's happening okay that's, this is that's not what I've been told that that they I've been told that they are paid the difference right. um, for the particular points of deployment I know for a fact that he was paid once we received his um, leave and earning statement from the military that's how we knew how much to pay him right. so we got that we paid him the difference. He was made whole. He never lost any money. He never had to pay back any money. That was um, misinformation. I, um, I got confirmation today from. Well, let's take it out well, of the specifics of any one employee and just focus generally on the policy right. and, and what right. the situation is, so mm -hmm. that we're not talking about any one individual. Because I think we get this could potentially apply to a few different people. Well, just over to, just to just to clarify that that no one had to pay back money. That he, the, the law was, it was, you know, He's sitting here tonight. We can ask him. He's sitting right there. Yeah. Out of the future earnings, she deducted uh, from, from holiday and... Um, and so, so you're firefighter, Alan, sir? Yes. Oh, would you like to come up to the table? Yeah, come because up to. Unfortunately, the cameras will not be able to pick up what you're saying if you're sitting in the back. So please feel free to bring up a chair. and Maybe we could share that microphone. Yes, you know, absolutely. Mr. Kelly. But I think we should move on from the specifics sure. of me, but... And you're talking about, well, I was deployed. Yes. I would, for the first month and a half or so before I could get her the LESs, um, she, I was getting paid. Right. And then I had to pay all that back. But you didn't, you didn't have to pay back anything. You never wrote the town a check. You no, just it, was, it was just deducted the from, difference. Fu from future received, earnings. Right, you received the difference. If we right. paid, you right. got $1,000, you got 800 from military, we paid you $200 every week. We made you whole. Right. 
that, that's what okay. the, that's what so was our, yeah, that was our policy, and that's how what's, what's a clarification? But weekend, LES, what does that stand for? Just for um, leave earn statement. statement. So it's basically a oh, pay okay. stub, just okay. proof of okay. earnings. That's all. Yeah. Okay. It sounds like. I'm sorry, and, but weekend drills. If uh, if I drill on a Saturday, then I have to pay back that. I'll get paid for the day, but then I pay back 100 percent of the the 24 hour shift. I, I think that there's some miscommunication somewhere along. So the if line, you were scheduled to be on on a Saturday yes, and, and you were at drill, you would have to pay back because you weren't because doing I your wasn't. I, yeah, because I wasn't. Right, I understand that. Five, yeah. Right. I think it's just the wrong term is payback because you're not really paying back. You're just well, he's not, not able. Getting, he's not able. Not, so right, he's going to have the shift. The way I look at this is well. he's not able to earn the money that he would have, yet he's doing. Um, a sacrifice yes. for us. Right. Well, is uh, he? I mean, he, could, could we clarify? I'm still confused. On, on, on a weekend drill, I'm confused. Is, is he getting the difference? Is he's supposed to be getting is the, the town difference paying the difference between his? Currently, I'm not getting the difference. No. So I think Should the question be. here is: is I think be, what, what other, some other towns law. have adopted, and and what we haven't um, is that you know, for firefighter Allen and others who are in this circumstance, he would be paid. Um, on top, he would be paid for the time that he would have served that Saturday or worked that 24-hour shift on that Saturday. Um, so that's the question for this board, whether we want to adopt that um, or not. You know, I think that's the bottom well, line. Let's let Paige continue, because it, it seems like the towns are all over the place. Right, right. So yeah, Before we get to that, because I know Miss Evelina has looked at a couple of different communities. I just want to be sure I understand that, because I was in the same boat as Tom. It was a little confusing. So the firefighters work 24-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. So. You, so you're, I guess what you're saying is if you were oh, if you're if you were scheduled to work on a Saturday, mm -hmm. but you have guard duty that right. particular weekend, then the guard duty would only be is that what eight or ten hours or I don't know how long the typical right. So yeah, I think it's considered. So 12. in other words, you, you're because you're getting paid by the guard for that day. You're not you're not working your full 24 hours. Is, is that is the hourly difference where there's a disconnect here? Yeah. So if I'm if I'm on drill, then. Uh, and I'm not here. I don't get paid anything from here because I'm getting. I'm obligated for that weekend to be there, and that's why a lot of t with this law you have 17 days or uh, 30 something for for um, state because you can get activated under different different so you, orders. So you can't work that that Saturday. That is, you is that right. Right. Trading yes. off with somebody, or or is that? That's against you, Sarah. I read that. Well, yes, I understand statement. that. But you, I mean, you can voluntarily trade off. You can uh, voluntarily. But um, right. So what I'm what I'm proposing to you guys is that we adopt this general law. That I mean, we can argue all night whether he got paid or he didn't get paid. But I, we, we've compared our tax returns. We worked the same hours. He made six thousand dollars less than me last year. Well, let's just let's just clarify something. So, so the, the only body that can adopt this state statute is town meeting. So what you're really asking us yes. is to submit a warrant article to the May town meeting. But in order for this board to do that. You know, we need then we need to make sure we have enough information because the next step is the warrant committee, and they're going to be asking a lot of the same questions we're asking. So right. we need to be sure that among the three of us and the town administrator and the town government that we can go into the warrant committee and say, okay, here's the situation, and we can you know explain it. I'm sure they'd probably want to hear from from all of you too, but we need to be able to understand it in order to explain it to the warrant committee and then to town meeting. So um, there's also a question of it looks like. If I, in reading these statutes, one section refers to 30 days, another one refers to 17 or 34 days. It, is that, it, the way I read it, it looks like it's just dependent upon what type of service you're in, whether you're on sure, active duty, whether you're on the guard, whether it's Well, guard, yeah, guard could get activated for state orders and federal orders. Reservists can only get activated for uh, federal orders. So the time so you may, I, changes yeah, depending on what depending type on, of depending service Depending on the you're occupation doing. and, yeah, okay. right. just get called up more. And so, the statute only really applies to the first month because after the first month, then the existing town policy pays the difference from day one. Whereas, if I, if I understand this correctly, that if, we, if town meeting were to adopt this statute, then first it's 30, days. day 31 is the first 30 days. Yeah, the difference. Um, the full the, the firefighter or the DPW employee, whoever it might be, would be paid their full salary, and then the difference would kick on a day 31 going forward. That's right. Okay, so just so we're <clears throat> so the 17 or 34 days are for their weekend drills. So, so here's how it works in 2016 and 17, because of because we work 24 hour shifts, um, 
a, a group on the Milton Fire Department will work 26 weekends. Six of those weekends will be on the first of the month. That would be drill weekend. During those drill weekends, he can't report to the fire department and be at drill both times. But when, when, when a normal guy who's in the driller reserve, he works nine to five Monday through Friday, and then he goes to the reserves on the weekend. So he usually doesn't miss much time at work, you know? But with us, where we're working so many weekends and where one day is two shifts, because of that, we tend to miss more time. I'm, I don't know, hope, hope I'm making that clear. So, so if Tim is to go to his reserve time on a Saturday or Sunday, he can't then be in the firehouse during that time. So, so the, the 34 days, 34 paid days per year would cover his drill weekends only and, and his two weeks in the summer. If he was to get deployed, the town would be responsible for the first 30 days of a deployment and then after that time, it's their responsibility to just make up the difference between his base pay and his salary, which is, is not a, we're not talking about a lot of money when it comes to that, you know. Um, one other point that I wanted to make clear to the board was that um, when these guys join the Reserve Board Guard, they get off the, the town of Milton's health insurance. So, the, you know, a, a family plan like, like the one I have cost the town roughly $18,000 per person, you know. Uh, drill and reservists, and they all get on TRICARE, which saves the town money, you know. So from, I mean, we all know that this is the right thing to do to adopt this law, but from a financial standpoint, the town is way in the green, even just paying them for their, you know, if we have to pay them that thirty-five to $5,000 a year for the time that they missed. So for the length of the service, so if somebody is called up to active duty and they're out of, they're gone for, say, let's just use round number, six months, yep. then for those six months, they're not on the town health insurance system, they're on the government. They're the never, no, no, they're never on the town's health insurance system. They're on TRICARE once they join the reserves. We have the option oh, right of TRICARE, and TRICARE so is... Right. never on the town's system. Right, right. Okay. So I'm not on the town now because it's comparable to what the town has to offer as far as co and stuff yeah. like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but if he were to get deployed for six months, the town would be responsible to pay him for his first month full pay. And from that point on, they would be responsible to just make up the difference. Um, federal law, they have to make up the difference anyway. The only difference with this mass general law is paying that first 30 days at full pay. That's, that's the only difference that we're talking about here. Now, before we go to Missy Bolito on her, the other research she's done with the other communities, I just want to clear up something you said earlier about the police and the fire. The fire fighters work 24-hour shifts. The police do not work shifts that long. This is usually how it gets brought up in other towns and communities is somebody, a police officer or, or firefighter, because of their schedule, brings it to the town. Other, other towns have done this. Other businesses do. A lot of businesses, even though they don't have to, they just look to the Mass General Law. You but know, for, but for it guys. sounds from what Mr. Kelly was saying that the police have been, if somebody, and I don't know how many people they may have who, are, who this might apply to, but from what you said, it sounds as though they're, this is being paid out of the police budget, whereas Right. It's well, their not salaries are already anything. budgeted for. It's not on top of their budget. We're not asking for extra money other than his budgeted salary. We're just asking that he paid, gets paid his whole budgeted salary. But there are different practices in the police and fire is what that's I was right. saying. That's right. There is. And, and, that was and in the DPW, it sounds like. So that's why I think that the town should take a look at this and develop one policy through the personnel board that covers everybody. All, all I understand it was same. one policy, so I, that, that's news to me. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So you had mentioned that the police department had paid Right. Um, so that was probably, you're probably unaware of that. No, no, there no, isn't currently a regatta reservist over there right now, but there has been in the past. And that was, that was kind of the problem, that there, there's not one currently. So. Right. I understand they would pay the difference, but I would follow up on that. Yeah. Okay. The difference on their weekend drills or the difference on their two weeks in the summer? Difference on everything. On their weekend was, drills as well. We followed your story with the police department as well. That's my understanding. That's what yeah. I've been told. But I'll follow up that's with not the what police the chief. police chief told me, but that's fine. Okay, we'll, let, we'll look into, let's look into that. Why don't we give Missy e. Bolito a chance to go through her sure. research on the on some other communities? So I did originally reach out to the ten um, towns that we compare ourselves to, and what I found was either they just didn't have the um, experience of having this they didn't have the issue they just didn't have the issue they didn't deal with it and they didn't have a current policy to you know forward on to me um, towns that have adopted it uh, Hingham Randolph Canton Stoughton um, and they have adopted it and adopted different sections of it though each town's a little different um, for instance um, like Brookline 
for the annual training, they'll pay full, you know, they, they pay them in full. But for active duty, they will only pay the difference. So they seem, there's six sections of the, of the law, and each town just seems to um, have chosen whichever component of it that, you know, and that's how they wrote up their policy. So um, Sto uh, Randolph, for, um, for example, they just pay, no matter what, if it's a weekend or two weeks, they pay um, in full. And um, that's always been their practice. Um, I spoke to I spoke to Boston, and they told me that they actually um, they pay the difference only without using any accrued leave, and that's been their policy for the last five years. That's not what the fire See, I know. There's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of human resources for the city of Boston. That they adopted it, I think, back in the fifties. I spoke to the director. How did you handle each your guys? So we, we have a person. We had a person on military leave. Currently, he gets the differential for so just his so he's active. Well, what does right he get? Now? For, yeah, he's for active his, right now. Right. What, what yeah. about for his weekend drills? Uh, he would get the difference. So you're saying that because according to our research, Boston adopted this law in the fifties, and, and they get. I know Boston Fire gets 34 paid days. Right. You can adopt different sections of it. That's what they. That's what you know. There's six sections of it. Um, and each town's different, so it's it's actually. Um... Paige, can I ask you a question? So when sure. you spoke with the Boston HR director, and it says that they pay the difference, do we know whether that's day one or day thirty-one? Oh, that was she said um, day one. Day one, okay. Can't pays the difference. Can't pays no, the difference. No, can't pays their guys their full salary. Yeah, can't pays, yes. pays full. Can't pays full. Yeah, nor would if you're saying can't adopt the version of the law which allows paying the difference for weekly. Based on military pay. Oh, I'm sorry. Westwood, yes. Norwood, and um, Wellesley all have adopted the law. Right. And Bedford recently adopted the law. Yes, they adopted the law, but this this particular section of it that states that you can you pay the difference. You pay you make them whole. I don't I don't think that your findings are correct on that. Okay, well <laughs> all right, well So yeah. I'm asking the town of Milton to adopt this general law in its in its whole form. Um, I haven't heard of anyone Adopting a part here and there, um, but that's that's news to me. But um, you know all, you know all the other fire unions that we spoke to, their guys are are getting paid for up to their 34 days. You know, so has anyone, in, in, not just the firefighters, but either the town, former town administrator or the HR director, has anyone talked to the personnel board about this issue? No, this is this is what brought it all up. So it hasn't gone that far okay. yet. Yeah, and they meet monthly. So do you know, you know if we have a meeting but coming? In addition to that, they have a section in their collective bargaining agreement, the fire department, that says that the town will pay the difference. Right. That was from 1978. But it's in, when, but it's, but it's but in when, the collective. But our our, our contract. The town. The, I mean. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that your collective bargaining agreement trumps the personnel board. But it doesn't trump a state law. It doesn't trump the state law, but it's it's usura. It's we pay the difference. Right. That's all I'm saying. It's it's in your collective bargaining agreement. It was adopted. I think that there was then. such a large gap between when we had someone in 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 the service and now, and when we did have that person in the service, we weren't working 24-hour shifts. We were working two days and two nights. Right. So it wasn't as big of a financial burden on his family as as it is on on the firefighters now, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. You know, a, a six percent pay cut for for a guy making. Sixty thousand dollars a year is a lot of money. You know what I mean, and especially living in, in Milton, it's an expensive town. You know. Um, it sounds to me, at the very least, we have a question here that as to the the weekend service, uh, Saturday guard duty, and the inability to do a twenty four hour shift on on that day. So it sounds to me there's at least a, a question right. relating to that. Um, right. It, perhaps we need to do some clarification or some follow up <laughs> offline on a couple of these other questions, but. I'm not opposed to this going to town meeting, I, but I think we need to pin down a little more of these answers. We have until January 5th. The warrant does not close till January 5th. This should be a fairly easy article to have written just to see whether the town accepts the provisions of the statute. That's right. usually how the article gets written, and then, right. then, the, you know, then the, we'd go through the whole warrant process where the warrant committee would make a recommendation to town meeting and do a lot of research and ask a lot of the questions that we're asking. Right. So um, I would be inclined to send this to town meeting to have a discussion and have town meeting weigh in on it. Since that's the entity that can adopt it, that this board cannot. Right. The statute does require a town meeting vote. 
but I think I think since we have a month before we close the warrant, we need to try to get some more. We need to clarify some of the information that's come out tonight. That's my personal opinion. I'd be interested in my colleagues. If I can, if I can just read um, page four of this, it says, uh, an employee of a city or town which by a vote of its county commissioners, city council, or inhabitants at a town meeting has accepted this section or similar provisions of early laws shall be entitled to the benefits and the, pro and the protections of this section or the benefits of an accepted earlier law. So if, if the town that you're speaking with adopts this law, they adopt the law. If they adopt the law, they don't. They, they abide by the, the, the they don't pick law, out a section. They don't and pick and sections and follow this they, part. They can pick out part. whatever they want, but they if can. they adopt the actual law, they can't, they can't There's no take it apart yet. after yeah. that. Yeah. Right, that's a question. So the three towns that we brought to the table that have officially adopted the law, they abide by the, the law. They don't dice it up. Okay. But if a town you know, wants to break apart the law and just adopt the sections that they want, Right. They can do that. But, they, but just to be clear, that town did not adopt that law. All right, that well, that's, town, a, that's a question we can ask town council to weigh in. And the good news there is that his office represents a lot of towns, so it would right. probably be easier for that. They'd be in a good position to, to really have an understanding of that and know what the practices have right. been in other communities. I'd be interested to hear what my two colleagues think on this to this point. I, um, so I've, I've digested a lot of this information over the last couple of months. And, you know, I look at some of the other towns that, that we compare ourselves to and what they have done. and. You know, the times that we're in right now um, as a country, and, um, you know, it, it's, for me, um, you know, this is a no-brainer to adopt it. I'm one of three votes here, I, you know, and I, I totally recognize that you may disagree with me, but I stand firm in supporting this, and I'd like to see this go to town meeting in its entirety, and uh, I'd really like to, to vet this with you all and hope that uh, we can resolve it and, and maybe get to that point. Tom. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things, you know, clearly you know, people that, that give up their time for service to the country are, are to be applauded, clearly, and, and nobody wants to do anything to harm or discourage that. Um, however, you know, we, we still are a town that works on very, very, very tight budgets that every single year we are pushing whether we need an override. We do an override, and then we'll just look into the next override. Um, so, even the smallest bubble, and I think we have to think very carefully about that. So, I mean, it, it's, and it's not, you know, I, I feel bad saying it in the context of people giving service to their country, because, like I said, it is, you know, the, the, you know, the most noble thing you can do. Um, but I think we have two questions, really. I mean, one is whether to, to, a citizen group can always submit. You only need 10 signatures for a citizen article. That's always an option for anybody in, in the town, and it's certainly it's an option for employees. So I think we can either, first of all, would be to submit a warrant article to town meeting, sure. get this question debated at town meeting. It doesn't mean we have to take a position on the merits of it. Right. I, I've still got, we've got some open questions based on information that's come out tonight. I mean, we could, we could let it go through several months through the Warren Committee process before we decide ultimately whether to support the article or not. But I think the question for us right now, given that we've got a month before the warrant closes, is whether to submit the article to town meeting. If we don't submit it, then it's going to be up to citizens to right. submit it. And I think the process is usually better if a town board rather than citizens submit an article. So, I mean, I'd, I'd be willing to submit the article. And again, I think... In, in we have some preliminary research that Paige has done with a number of communities. We've got some questions that have come up that I think we need to get some answers for. Because, again, the Warren Committee is going to ask the same questions. And, and they're going to be saying, us, hey, Board of Selectmen, you submitted this article. Come in and tell us about it. And it, so we have to know the answers in order to be able to talk to them. And in, in all likelihood, it would be part and parcel of an override vote this year. Um, I mean, we we're looking at, at an extremely tight budget as, as far as we know right now. I mean, it's still very preliminary, but, um, but you know, everybody is thinking that, you know, we dodged a bolt last year and not having an override that it's, it's unlikely. I think, um, Tom, I think you're right. And you brought up some very good points about how difficult it is right now, the circumstances we're in as a town financially and how tight our budget is. And there's no question about that. And, um, and you've done a fine job over the last couple of years in ensuring that we're maximizing that. And, um, but I think, you know, right now, this is a small portion, okay? I think looking down the road, it could be larger. But we also have to prioritize. And I think that that's what our job is to work with the Warren Committee on prioritizing. And I agree um, with From that. a town's perspective, you know, 
Um, we could get, you know, when we go back and forth between schools and town, you look at the, the schools um, generally drain more from the budget aspect than the town. The town has been the one over the last several years who has not had um, really the, the, um, the resources to be able to maintain itself to the highest levels. And I think that the, the public safety falls under that, and we owe it to the public safety members for that. Can I just speak to it money-wise? Because I, I understand where you're coming from with that, you know, with budgets and all. But if these guys were to quit drilling because they're not properly getting compensated at work, it would add 18000 per guy to this town's health insurance budget, as opposed to paying them the 3500 to 5000 of the money of their salary, which is an already budgeted for item. So, I mean, financially, if you're talking about saving the town money, the best way would be to keep these guys in the reserve financially only. I mean, money-wise, 3500 as opposed to 18000 per guy is, is a savings to the town. I mean, never mind just the town of Milton, you know, showing their support for what these guys are doing mm -hmm. is, is huge, you know. But, but I think getting back to it, as, as the Madam Chair has said, you know, um, you know, potentially drafting this up uh, as a town meeting article. Yep. Um, I think that, you know, I think the citizens of Milton respect and understand the value. Um, I think that um, at that point, you know, um, we'll have the conversations with the Warren Committee. Um, they will be tough conversations, as they always are. Everything is a tough conversation, as it should be. Um, but I'm confident that, you know, we'd be able to work together and, and try to get something done in some capacity. Can I just ask one question? Yes. If you guys are going to put this in front of the warrant, it's going to be put in front of the warrant in its entirety. Is that correct? I guess. I think something we'll, we'll have to we'll, study, really. Yeah, well, I, okay. but I think we're going to have to do it. if you're not, can we get plenty of heads up? So sure. if you're not, I, we'll put it in front of town yes. meeting. So, well, so I think what our next step probably to do here is, is to talk with our town council about the discussion we've had tonight. In addition to that, we're going to need to look into the issues such as how is the police department handling this versus the fire department versus the DPW if there are differences? We need to check into that. We need to check into, we have some good research that's been done by the human resources director. Uh, Firefighter Kelly and Alan have been given some contrary information from fire departments. So we need to probably do a little bit of follow up and try to clarify what the situation is in some of these other towns. And we need to talk with our town council about an article. Uh, from what I'm hearing, I don't know, Tom, whether you're on board. I, I think David and I are at least inclined to submit the Warren article. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no problem. Okay. I, and just a matter of what gets cool. submitted and, and, and analyzing what the, what the total cost, you know, potential costs are and everything else, sure. Yeah. But uh, one thing you might want to think about, though, uh, because there is only a month oh, yeah. or so to uh, uh, right. the Warren deadline. You may want to just gather your 10 signatures and, and have it ready to go. Mm -hmm. You don't have to submit it if we wind up submitting one. Okay. Um, but that may be the most prudent direction to go in, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, the, the only issue with citizen petitions is no, normally, well, I mean, in the vote. past, there have been citizens petitions. This should be a straight, a pretty easy article just to see if the town will vote to accept the provisions right, yeah, of the it's statute. Not hard to so write. it's not a, and, but um, sometimes citizens. Normally, if a, citizen, if a group of citizens submits an article, then it's not something that town council will ever weigh in and rewrite for them. Whereas if a town board writes it, it's right, town council's what, job what, to What I'm saying, though, is you know, if, if they don't get, you know, it, it, as we deliberate, if we come up yep. with something that's not adopting 100% of the law, then yes. they're going to want to come up with this. So they may want to just have that thing ready. They don't have to submit it. I, I think maybe what we should try to do is, since January 5th is the deadline, we're meeting on the 6th and on the 20th, try to see if we can get some clarity on some of these questions. Yeah, I Before agree. the 20th. I agree. The 6th is only next week. Before the 20th, we can then, um, Fire Ray Kelly, you're the head of the, uh, the head of the union? Or no, the vice president. The vice president of the union. So we can get back to the union and let them know where we're at in, in the matter. and. If we have a draft at that point, we can show them the draft. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can have you back in on the 20th if, if you're able to make it and if, if we need to have a follow-up conversation. I should just, for the record, um, we have a letter from Peter Rizzi, president of the Milton Public Employees Association, uh, which came in today. I think everyone got a That's copy right. of this by email. So just, um, support this particular union supporting the, the adoption of the statute. So we, do, we did receive that letter. One thing I want further clarification on too is the, the, the 17 and 34 days because I'm not exactly sure that was confusing what that me means. Well. Right. That's yeah. confusing to anyone reading it. And what they're saying is uh, 17 days in a federal fiscal year. So if you're a reservist working for the federal <laughs> government, 
it's 17 days, uh, 34 days in the state fiscal year. So if you're in the guard and where you can be activated more regularly for, for local stuff. So state you, activation. State activation for a storm or, or whatever. Yes. Yeah, so Title 32 orders and Title 10 orders is federal, which is worldwide. Okay. Right. And for that, you don't even get paid. But it is confusing. I've read it for the past two years repeatedly, and I, that part is <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Still yeah, it took us a while to figure yeah. that one out. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that would be a. I would, you know, obviously it'd be great for us if you guys put this in. You guys, but, really but we would, be. we would like it in in its entirety, you know, which is not oh. that complicated. So why don't you pencil in the twentieth of December for? Let's try to figure out whether we get all the questions answered by then. And in the meantime, if we can have Ms. Ippolito and Mr. Allen talk about the weekend situation, just so we make sure everybody's on the same page. Right. I think that would be helpful to the discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so if it does go in this town meeting, when would it be adopted? It would be... It, it, the May town meeting. May, that's and, what yeah, it would be effective. It would be effective upon the I know the DPW has passage, a soldier yeah. getting deployed in March, right? Mm -hmm. Is it March? Yes, sir. So I don't know if there's anything that we can, we can do for him. Uh, uh, you can't, I don't think anything can make it retro. I, mean, I, I'm, I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know that for a fact. Let's check into any options that we might have on that. Right. Um, okay. And, and, yeah, you're probably right. But let's let's check and see if we have other options that we could. Yeah, but we I could think having another meeting on the 20th, getting all of our information together, um, and um, you know, hopefully getting on the same page with this um, is the good good idea. So. Very good. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any questions or comments? From anybody? I just got a table? question about like how, how many towns do we have to get? Because I know I have like ten towns that have adopted it, and then you get ten towns that haven't adopted it. Right. How far do you want to go? Before, I mean, we're not going to be the first to adopt it. We're not going to be the last. But it seems yeah. that there's precedent all over the map on this. And, and, and they are. Yeah. Yeah. But I'll find and ten towns that, that have adopted it. Page to our credit has given us a lot of yes. great information. Yeah. Yes. Um, a lot of information on what a lot of the different towns do. So I mean, we're, we're pretty educated on that. And I, as I told you, you know, I'm one member here. I believe that you know, if we are a great town, which I believe we are, that we would adopt this in full entirety. Now, um, it, that doesn't mean that my colleagues agree. They may agree. They may not agree. Um, but you know, we also have to look at what's fiscally responsible. And I believe, for me and my vote, that this is a fiscally responsible thing and a priority for our town moving forward. Well, I think currently we're only talking about a small handful of people. Three employees. Three, yeah, the, the bigger issue I think is going to be in the future if, you know, sometimes something gets adopted and then in year 20, maybe the circumstances were different then. So it doesn't sound like it'll be as much of an immediate issue as it would be a possibly. Again, Historically, possibly. we haven't had, I mean, two, yeah. two firefighters. I think it's in our vicinity to years. Boston. So once guys are in the Guard or Reserve, they, they move over to Boston for that, for that job. If they're looking for a civil service job. So, Mr. Allen, do you have, you mentioned 10 towns, do you have is that you've got anything in writing that you could send over to Paige? In your I have three in there. I can, I can get more. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll. Uh, um, yeah, it's we'll the last the page is there in there for you. It's just not all towns have all that information online, and then. Okay. Paige, anything else you would like to add? <laughs> Good. Thanks. Okay. I know that there is some discrepancy as to how he's been being paid, Pretty making much. up the difference, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, you know, if we do go through that, and there has been a mistake in his pay, where he, what, they weren't making up the difference on his weekend drill, I think that firefighter Allen should be reimbursed for that money um, if there was a mistake in, in his payment. Okay. Well, we'll take that under advisement. Let's get the facts first, and then we'll figure out mm -hmm. where we go from there if that's the case. Very good. Okay. All right, well, thank you all. Thank you. Firefighter Allen, Firefighter Kelly, and Mr. Thank, thank you very much. And all the firefighters and other employees who are here, thank you for thank coming you. in as well. emptied out, but we're yes. left with our planning director, Bill Clark, who's <coughs> here to talk to us about number eight. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for waiting. 
No problem. Thank you for having us. Patience. Um, you all introduce yourselves. Sure. My name is Andrea Agostino. I'm an environmental um, from the Environmental Permitting Group for National Grid. With me tonight is Dennis McCaffrey, who's from our Customer and Community Relations Group. And uh, we thank you for putting us on the agenda. We're here tonight to um, seeking approval to conduct subsurface archaeological testing on town of Milton land um, surrounding our gas station off Randolph Avenue. And if you're familiar with the station, it's south of the Granite Hills Golf Course and bounded by town of Milton land, town of Quincy land, and DCR land, the edge of the Blue Hills. And we're proposing in beginning the permitting stages for a project, an inline inspection program project, where basically we'll be installing equipment outside the substation, uh, excuse me, the gas station, that will allow us to do our federally mandated inspections of the gas pipeline every seven years or more often as we um, need to. And as part of that permitting process, we'll be triggering um, federal, state, and local permits. And one of the aspects we need to do is the property, as you probably know, is located within a National Register of Historic Places. And as part of our permitting processes, the Massachusetts Historical Commission has asked us to do um, subsurface testing in a few areas of what's called high sensitivity to determine and kind of confirm the boundaries of that historic um, historic site so that we can use that information to confirm the boundaries in relation to our proposed project. So if you see in the packets, um, and I have extra copies if anyone needs them, we have a plan showing the actual gas station. And the areas we're proposing to test are what our archaeological firm, um, who I believe you've worked with before for the wind turbine project a few years ago, is the Public Archaeology Lab. They've walked the site with me, and um, we've mapped two areas around the station as purple, which is high sensitivity. What we're proposing to do would be hand dug 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter test pits, about 20 to 25 in these purple that's areas. Mm -hmm. Very small. Right. And those will be hand dug down to um, <clears throat> native parent material. In this rocky terrain, we're not sure if we can get even below 30 inches or so, but they'll be hand dug, backfilled once the archaeologists have recorded any information they may find. The material will be collected on tarps and used for backfilling. And it'll take up to a week uh, for the work to be done, but they can do up to five test pits a day. So it's a very short duration nature of work. And. Um, we are submitting a notice of intent filing with the Conservation Commission tomorrow because the proposed work is actually within buffer zone of wetlands on both sides of the station. And we also, because the property is within priority habitat, we also are submitting a filing to the Natural Heritage Program for this work. And we've been working with them extensively for our proposed project at the site. So the reason we're here is for town approval for this work, which is on town property. And um, as well as the property owner, we require your signature on the permit applications for both the Conservation Commission and the Natural Heritage Program. And the, the, archeo yeah, the archaeological um, committee will, will issue a report on their findings? Yes. The, we already have the permit from the Mass Historical Commission, mm -hmm. which required us to do test in these areas. Yep. And so once a report is prepared, will be prepared following the completion of the work. It usually takes at least a month or so for them to catalog all the data. But we be absolutely can share that report with you mm -hmm. once it's prepared. Okay. okay. We've had the same testing done for Quarry Hills when they, when they oh, built yeah. the golf course. The we turbine. had it for the wind turbine. Okay. Here we are. We're right down the street from the wind turbine site. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think you said, and I might have misunderstood, but something about every seven years this is done. Has this been done, this kind of type of testing been done at this site previously? The, I'm sorry, the every seven years is the actual testing we need to do of our pipeline in the area. Okay. So that's done every seven years. How that is usually done is a large excavation opening up the pipeline and then sending equipment down it. The eventual project is permanent above ground um, infrastructure, which will allow us to send a sensor down every seven years or more often. Um, will facilitate and have no ground disturbance during that um, inspection going forward. So that's that's the end goal of the project we're looking at. But to get there, all the permits we need require this step with the archaeological testing. Okay. We have a motion here. I'm not sure if the motion is correct or not because the motion is to allow the testing. Um, or to 
no, not to allow it, but to, to approve the request to perform subsurface testing. I question whether that's a correct motion. Is that what we're trying to accomplish, or are we trying to uh, Bill, do you have any thoughts on that? I haven't seen the motion. Can I see the motion? Yeah. The, the motion is to approve the testing. I'm not sure that that's what we want to do right now. No, we want to uh, we want to approve the um, allowing PAL to take and do their that, subsurface yeah their subsurface testing. I, I I know what you mean. Yes, we want yeah, our it's our it's application will be our vote will be to allow PAL PAL is to, the uh, acronym for Public Archaeological Lab. Okay, out of Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's Duncan Ritchie, if you remember the name. Um, we want to allow PAL to come in and do an archaeological testing on town land adjacent to the Boston Gas take station. Yeah, that sounds better. Uh, Would you like to make that motion then? Uh, I may need help again, but okay, I'd, I'd like to propose a motion uh, to. Um, approve uh, a request for uh, PAL, which is the Public Archaeological Laboratory, laboratory uh, to perform certain testing uh, or archaeological effects on... To do subsurface testing for archaeological, any archaeological finds, finds on, on, on town, town land, land. Adjacent, okay. adjacent to, adjacent to 750 the, Randolph Avenue. The, the land owned by Boston Gas. Yes. I'll second that motion. Okay. Do we have any other discussion on the motion? I do not. I don't. Is there anything else that you would like to add? The only question I have is that we have the actual application signature pages here, and I just didn't know the process. This is a first for me. Um, whether they can be signed now by the selectmen so we can put them in the um, applications and submit them tomorrow, or if it's a, a different process to get yeah, those we, signatures. We vote now. I don't see why we couldn't sign it. We could right sign it now. now. We normally sign yes. at the end of meetings, but yeah. We can do it now so that we can. They're, they're making a filing tomorrow with conservation. They'll file for a notice of intent. They'll appear before them December, I believe, 13th, right? That's 13th. Right. Okay. It has to be noticed in the paper, so that's why they're getting it all in ahead of time. All right. Do yes, we have any other discussion on the motion or any other questions? No. Then all in favor of, of the motion? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Okay, then why don't we pass that around and we'll sign it while you're here. How have we done it? Okay. Why don't we at least start, start signing that one? In the past, we've got signature property. How, how do we do it with the? Um, do we have to do that with the town farm? Was it the chairman? I just won. Today's eleven. On on the um, one of them is all three, and then the others, I believe, just the chairman. Right. Would that just be Katie's chair? Probably, yeah. Yes, it's representative. Can you take the other two pages off? Take this. Yeah, and Tom can sign this one. Huh? Okay. I'll take this one. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, let me just, sorry about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank, thank you for the time. Thank you, thank you very much. much. Okay, the next item on our agenda is um, a request for a letter to the town clerk regarding a ballot question. This, this is a request that came in from the town clerk's office, and we don't really believe a letter is needed because the statute itself
really addresses this, and it says that it, the, the question shall be submitted to the voters at the next annual election. Right. So we, it really, by operation of law, it's, it's effective already. If we need a letter from the, to give to the town clerk for, for her purposes. Um, I'm fine with that. Want to just authorize? We don't have a draft letter tonight that we can all sign. Do we want to authorize the chair to sign a letter as needed Absolutely. to this effect? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So I'll make a motion to approve and uh, authorize the chair uh, to sign a letter requesting that the town clerk include a question in April annual town election ballot to determine if the town wishes to have a three or five member board of selectmen. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, we have several licenses to approve tonight. We're starting with liquor license applications. Okay, I'll propose a motion to approve the following 2017 liquor license renewals contingent upon the receipt of all necessary certificates required by Chapter 304 Acts of 2004 signed by the Building Inspector and the Fire Department. 88 Wharf, 88 Wharf Street, Abbey Park, 550 Adams Street, Hojarn Inc., DBA, Mr. Chance, 534 Adams Street, Milton Fuller Housing Corp., 1372 Brush Hill Road, Milton Fuller Housing Corp, 1399 Brush Hill Road, Milton Hoosier Club, 193 Central Ave, Novara, 556 Adams Street, Steel and Rye, 95 Elliott Street, the plate at Milton Marketplace, 10 Bassett Street, Wallston Golf Club, 999 Randolph Ave, Ichiro Sushi, 538A Adams Street, Fruit Center, Inc., 338 Granite Avenue, Central Ave Liquor Mart, 26 Central Avenue, Delaney Liquors, Inc., 368 Granite Ave, Esprit de Vin, Inc., 25 Central Ave, American Legion, Post 114. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Sunday openings. Okay. I'll propose a motion to approve uh, 2016 annual Sunday opening permit uh, for Central Ave Liquor Mart, Delaney Liquors, Esprit de Vin, and the Fruit Center. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next one is common VIC licenses, and this is a long one. Yeah, propose a motion to approve the following 2017 common VIC license renewals, 556 Adam Street, LLC, DBA, Novara, 556 Adam Street, B&D, Ichiro, DBA, Ichiro Sushi, 538A Adam Street, Behind the Other Net, 11 U U Unquity Road, Coffee Break, Inc., 24 Central Lab, Hojarn, Inc., DBA, Mr. Chans, 534 Adam Street, Jenna's Place 2, DBA, JCI, Houghton's Pond Concession, 1287 Pleasant Street, Canton, Mass, uh, LETHE, LLC, New England, DBA, Brugger's Bagel Company, 360 Granite Ave, Milton, LLX, DBA, Dunkin' Donuts, 545 Adams Street, Milton Fuller Housing Corp, DBA, Fuller Village, 1372 Brush Hill Road, Milton Fuller, Housing Corp, DBA Fuller Village, 1399 Brush Hill Road, Milton's Opus LLC, DBA Steel and Rye Restaurant, 95 Elliott Street, New Newcomb Farms, 1130 Randolph Ave, Spellbound Inc, DBA Milton House of Pizza, 537 Adams Street, Starbucks Coffee, number 7565, 552 Adams Street, Sellers Luncheonette, 558 Adams Street, The Plate, 27 Central Ave, The Plate at Milton Marketplace, 10 Bassett Street, Tino's Pizza, 22 Central Avenue, Twigo Management LLC, DBA, GH and Benton Company, 7 Pleasant Street, Welch Restaurant Management LLC, DBA, Abbey Park, 550 Adam Street, Wharf Restaurant Group LLC, 88 Wharf Street. I'll second. Any discussion? Yeah. I have to leave sometimes we have that many restaurants. Right. <laughs> but, um, we need all, a speed reader. That's <laughs> yeah, all an auctioneer. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, the next item is uh, an appropriation from the Mary L. Peabody Fund for Holiday Gifts. Okay, I'll propose a motion to approve a grant uh, in an amount to be determined uh, from the Mary L. Peabody Fund. Um, I guess, do we have an actual amount? Three, the, the most that we can expend is $334.26. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a five thousand dollar balance in the trust, but we can only spend the income from it, and I, probably Certainly there was. You have voted two hundred dollars in years past. Okay, are, are we actually doing an amount right now? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we we. So we need a discussion on an mm -hmm. amount. Right. Because this motion is just written to and be determined. To, you have to, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Ms. Ms. Martin sent over, she obtained the paperwork from the treasurer for the 1912 documentation that created this, this um, fund, um, and it just said to, 
the money, five thousand dollars of money to be invested in the income thereof to be distributed annually and to the poor. Thirty four dollars so of expenditure. What the funds. income currently is is three thirty four twenty six. Probably some of it is just built up over time because the, the board hasn't appropriated the full amount. But yeah. Um, and if we were to appropriate, is there any the reason full, not to appropriate the full amount? No, I think it's just within you know, a smaller amount next year that would be available. But yeah, I don't think there's any reason not to appropriate the full amount. Yeah. All right. So. I'll, I'll um, make a motion to approve a grant in the amount of $334.26 from the Mary L. Peabody Fund for the purchase of Christmas gifts for the needy Milton residents. I'll second that motion. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, town Administrator's report. Do we sure. have anything to report tonight? Uh, just that uh, I would like to thank everybody for sitting in on the first Board of Selectmen's meeting. Um, <clears throat> I have to extend my deepest gratitude. To Anne Marie Fagan, I have been uh, nothing short of a puppy dog following her around the place <laughs> the past two days. Um, and what I have learned in, in, in that 48-hour period is amazing. What, what the institutional knowledge, not only in her brain, but uh, many of the people through town hall that she's introduced me to. Um, and there'll be a quiz tomorrow, I think, on, on the people I've met with their names. But uh, <laughs> it, it's been a, a wonderful 48 hours, m better than I could have expected. Great. Um, I, I said it uh, last week when I signed the contract that the, I believe this to be a well-oiled machine. It is just that. Um, I'm starting to look behind the curtain and see some very diligent civil servants uh, sat down with some department heads, have some meetings set up for next week, some one-on-ones to, to go over some logistics and uh, operational plans. Working through the budget with with uh, Anne Marie, mm -hmm. um, That's great. Emily and Barbara, Lisa, uh, Paige in the office. It's it's phenomenal. Uh, got here yesterday morning very early, and the IT department set up a computer for me, a laptop for me, a phone for me. It's it's uh, it's it was very I was very welcome to be here. So great. Um, a lot more to come in, the, in uh, tomorrow and the in the coming days, but uh, very very happy and uh, excited to be here. You've hit the ground running. You've been going to a Massport meeting this morning. Yes, I heard. A very robust meeting. I heard. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. That's great. I just want to thank news. everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Finally. Yeah. Good. Well, we're, we're looking forward to working with you. The only thing I was going to mention under the Chairs Report is just for anyone watching live tonight, tomorrow night, November 30th at 7 o'clock, is the tree lighting ceremony that the Chamber of Commerce puts on over at the um, in East Milton on the deck. So that would be a worthwhile event, especially for young families, if, if people had the time. But other than that, I do not have a report tonight. Do, does anyone have anything to report tonight? Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> special recognition um, should go out to uh, Sean McDonough, who's a police cadet. Um, he will be going to the uh, Marine Officers Training School on January 7th. Mm. Uh, and that's, um, that's a very desirable uh, group to be involved in. So I think that he, uh, and that's at Quantico. Um, so I think that he, you deserve special recognition, and uh, we wish him well yes. um, great. and success um, in that program. That's great. Wonderful news. Okay, anything else to report? I do um, not. We didn't have a citizen speak tonight. Any response to prior citizen speak? No. Nope. Future agenda items. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if we talked about it at a meeting or if Mrs. Fagan and I had a conversation about it, but one idea that we might like to do in probably in right after the new year in January is do kind of a whiteboard session. Now that we've got Michael on board, and um, just to highlight some of what the priorities for the board might be for a short six-month period, and then do it again at the start of the new fiscal year. And, yeah. And um, make sure we're we're all on the same page and we're thinking what are, mm -hmm. what are probably one of them will be what we talked about earlier tonight with substance abuse. Uh, if if nothing else, then for future agenda items, then I will move that we enter into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation, airplane noise, 693-711 Randolph Avenue, Chapter 40B appeal, and strategy with respect to real estate, uh, real, real property, Randolph Avenue, Dump Access Road, believing that having such discussions in open session would have a detrimental effect on the litigating and negotiating position of the board and to return to open session for the purpose of adjourning. And then we will conduct a, well, let's take a vote on that motion first. Yes, um, Mr. That. Burns. Yes. And Mr. Hurley. Yes. And myself, yes. So we're now going into executive session. We do have a meeting of the trustees of the Governor Stoughton Fund following, but that's also just an executive session, nothing an open session. So immediately after ending our executive session for the Board of Selectmen, we'll be going into executive session for the Governor Stoughton Fund. All right. We're now in executive session. Thank you, everyone.